Hello, Ralph Edwards. Back in the 1950s, This Is Your Life received a phone call from one of the greatest motion picture actresses of all time. She suggested that her mother's story would make a fascinating half hour. We agreed and did the program. Twelve years later, we thought it about time we surprised the famous actress herself. And that's what you're about to see on this true This Is Your Life classic. Here we are. She's also mysterious and rather hard to understand. She has a black Rolls Royce, a black plane. Wouldn't it be nice if everything were black and so the whole thing sort of held together and used different fabrics, different necklines, different, you know, silhouettes, and mostly different jewelry? Hi, everybody. It's Ralph Edwards. Boy, what an illustrious group. Betty Davis, what? Edith Head, Robert Wagner, Lou Morheim. My goodness, what's going to... What's the, four eligible candidates for our program. Uh, what's going on, anyhow? We're talking well, about clothes. What We've been it? discussing uh, some wardrobe for Betty Davis uh, for, the, for her film. What is the film? Uh, it's going to be called Madame Sin. And you're the, uh, the uh, producer? Producer. You are the star, the superstar, Betty Davis. Thank you're you. the uh, producer, uh, executive producer. Lou Morheim is the producer. It's called My Sin. Well, I don't know. Being this close to you, Betty, it's I think... It's called Madame Sin. Madam Sin? Sin? Yes. Oh, Madam that's right. One Sin. is a perfume. Yes. Well, one this, is a perfume. we can't really say this is going to, to smell or anything like that. If it does, it's going to be. You a said beautiful it, I didn't. Um, <laughs> Betty, being this close to you, I think it really would be a sin <laughs> not, to, not to say to you, Betty Davis, this I'm... is your life. <laughs> well, I remember his fond memories when he did not have his life. Now we pick up again. Well, this is uh, this is for Betty. Yeah. Well, this is kind of soften you up. You like yellow roses, don't you? <laughs> well, of course. Betty, I mean, this is to put you in a good beautiful. mood, and you can hang on to them while we whisk back to our uh, studio, where our director can hardly wait to say, "Camera action on the life of Betty." Davis. Well, Come along. Shall we go? Shall we go? Let's shall we make a night of it. for you if you need it. Here, would you want to come over on this side? Are this we, side, yes. we're friends, aren't we, Betty? Yes, we're friends. You, you didn't even know the show was back on the air. I did not, and I didn't know until that, that clip was over that, that, that you, it was for real. <laughs> you know, and I thought you were very rude to interrupt us. <laughs> oh, she was bawling me out uh, with no, her eyes, you know. I was just saying, why, why are you here? This, we're doing a thing for a new movie. What's it got to do with you? Then when you showed me the book, brand new with my name, I'd Dilled and, and the flowers, I thought, why flowers? <laughs> Madam Sin, you know. But at any rate, everything's okay oh. now, and you're ready to go. Let's give uh, Tommy Turbovich your, your roses, and he'll put All them right, in the you. water so that they'll be ready. Oh, thank you, Tommy. Tell you. Oh, you look beautiful. I wouldn't have with thought it. anybody could have done it. It's a this thrill to me. have you grace this stage, I'll tell you. Oh. Motion picture audiences all over the world have enjoyed you and. Over Thank 100, you. do you want it behind you? or That's I never know what to do with a lady's well, thing when they get this far. dump it. Yes. Oh, dump it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really do that. After all, Edith Head probably had a lot to do with that. No, this is not one of Edith's. I wish it were. It's a beautiful outfit, and I compliment you. Over 100 major motion pictures. I want to say Betty Davis is a star in every sense of the word. The voice of a man who really wanted to be here with you on this occasion, Willie and so he Wilder is. Three-time Academy Award-winning director for the best years of our lives, Mrs. Oh, Miniver and Ben-Hur, Mr. William Wilder. Oh, aren't you a doll? Betty, you, you put yourself here. through this. I'm delighted Come on, to be here. Hearts. You want to sit here, folks? Now, Mr. Wilder acted Betty Davis in uh, three oh, pictures. Yes. yes, come right yes. here. Was she uh, difficult? Sit down. Difficult? No. Easy? No. <laughs> uh, what I mean is, uh, she was difficult in a sense, in the same way I'm difficult. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Looks and like a long night, folks. <laughs> The way I think every good actress is, or should be, good. difficult by being very demanding of everyone, most of all, from herself. 
She wanted everything to be perfect and to be great, and most of the time it was. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. William Wyler. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my all-time hero as a director and the greatest one this town ever had, and you know I mean that. Oh, Don't I, Willie? Thank you, Willie. Thank you, Willie, so much. You too. Thank you. Betty Davis, you're born in Lowell, Massachusetts. One night during a thunderstorm, a bolt of lightning misses a house and hits a tree. In that flash, the tree is gone, but in the house, a child is born. Ruth Elizabeth Davis. Your dramatic entry into this world sets your pattern. The uncomplicated is put to rest, and obstacles of style and gusto become the norm. At the age of 12, while Betty was playing Santa Claus, she caught on fire. Betty, that's the voice of your sister, Bobby, here from Phoenix, Arizona, Mrs. Barbara Berry. <laughs> Bobby, you did say Betty caught on fire. Yes, she did. Um, we were at a boarding school called Crest Alban, mm -hmm. and they had no electricity. And Betty was going to play Santa Claus, and they had to use candles for lights. And suddenly, I turned around, and she was completely in flames. Well, wh what happened? I turned around, turned back to her. I couldn't look. I thought she was a complete little heap of ashes. <laughs> Might have been a good idea. What oh. happened? They, uh, obviously, they put the flames oh, yeah. out. It was the Santa Claus suit that uh, uh, caught they fire. They wrapped her right in a, a rug, as I remember it, mm. and mm. just beat the flames right out. What was life like while you and Betty were in school, Bobby? Well, after Crest Alvin, we were in and out of schools all the time. And our mother and fa father were divorced. And uh, my mother worked as a photographer to pay for the different tuitions. Mm -hmm. We were sort of three against the world. Well, it certainly was a determined team. And thank you, Barbara <laughs> Berry. <laughs> Through the financial hardships of this period, you seem to find comfort from an invisible spotlight that constantly shines on only you. In 1929, that spotlight materializes, and you're cast in your first professional play for the Cukor Condal Stock Company in Rochester, New York. The name of the play was Laugh That Off. I'll never forget it. In that play, Betty Davis gave me my first stage kiss. Here's a man you haven't seen in over 40 years, comedian Benny Baker. <laughs> Betty Davis gave you your first stage kiss? Yeah, and believe me, I was really nervous. <laughs> I bet you were. Why, Benny? Uh, how, how about you, Betty? Were you nervous in your debut, too? I don't remember kissing him. <laughs> I told you I've got a longer memory. Yes, you have a longer memory. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, you know, even in those days, Betty was a very dedicated actress. Well, she had to be to kiss me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, the kind of parts I played, I haven't been kissed since, and that's 40 years ago. <laughs> well, maybe Betty won't mind reenacting that scene with you. Thank you, Benny Baker, very much. Give her a thanks. Oh. I'm still nervous. You're still nervous. <laughs> Betty, that play leads to many plays and to Broadway. By 1931, the talkies have arrived, and Hollywood is clamoring for actresses with good speaking voices. You make your first picture for Universal Studios with Humphrey Bogart, titled The Bad Sister. I was the first person to see Betty Davis on film. Betty, you have never met this man, but he was your film editor on The Bad Sister, oh. Mr. Ted Kent. Ted Now, this is somebody from your life you, you really have never seen. No, uh, never Ted, what did you think when you saw that face? Don't uh, ask him. It was rather <laughs> odd. I saw something very refreshing. You did? It really? Uh, yes. In that film? It was horrible. Uh, a newcomer with something different. You really did? Yes, yes. And I was very impressed. Well, how very nice. Now, let's see. Uh, Betty, did you play the good sister or the bad sister? I played the good sister. You wanted to play the bad sister? No, no, no. You no. always wanted to play the good sister? I didn't sister. want to be in the film at all. Oh, I... <laughs> Ted, how did the studio feel about this new face? 
Well, they must have liked her because they renewed her contract for a grand total of three months. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Didn't like Ken. me at all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> Betty Davis, more options are picked up. You make five more pictures, and your contract runs out. Disappointed, disillusioned with Hollywood, you and your mom, Ruthie, who has since passed away, start packing to head back east. You get a call from the great actor George Arliss. He interviews you and gives you a part in his picture, The Man Who Played God. And this picture is a turning point. You're signed by Warner Brothers Studios. I was Betty Davis's stand-in. That's the voice of the woman who stood in for you in 35 pictures, Mrs. Sally Hutchinson. Sally. Sally Sage, you will remember her. Well, Ralph, was it 1933, and this is the first picture that Betty and I did together. It was the big shakedown, and she had a bedroom sequence, and she wore a nightgown. And they thought, uh, I like a little see-through. Even in those days? 1933, pretty racy. <laughs> so they tried to pour the backlight through. Mm -hmm. But this one is ahead, even then. Mm -hmm. And she'd had the nightgown very heavily <laughs> laced and coated underneath. Lined. Yeah. Lined. No way. Well, man. <laughs> <laughs> so never... all that effort went for nothing. Well, you never did it. Your modesty no. is refreshing, Betty. Thank you, Sally Hutchinson, very much. Stand in for Betty Day. On a loan out to RKO, you get a part in a picture with Leslie Howard that becomes a classic of human bondage. You become a full-fledged star. The following year, you win an Academy Award for Dangerous with Franchet Tone. You then have your eye on the picture, Anthony Adverse, but Olivia de Havilland gets the part. The first time I saw Betty Davis, she scared the daylights out of me. Betty, that's the voice of your good pal who flew in all the way from Paris, France, just to be with you, Miss Olivia de Havilland. Olivia, you mean Betty really scared you? Nearly to death. <laughs> we had to make three pictures together for her to warm up to me. Uh, Betty, is, really? that, is that the way you remember it? No, I don't remember. No. I feel I've always known and loved Olivia, so I yes. don't remember that. It wasn't really true. It wasn't true. Uh, no, not it was shame always. on not me. Not in the beginning. On. Do you remember the title of those pictures? I was probably jealous of you. You're so <laughs> damn good looking. <laughs> <laughs> Titles of pictures you well, made together. I can remember them. The first one was It's Love I'm After with Leslie Howard. And the second one was Elizabeth in Essex with Errol Flynn. And by the way, up until that time, I had always been Errol Flynn's leading lady. Yes. But this time in Elizabeth in Essex, Betty was his leading lady, and I was demoted to her lady in waiting. <laughs> I was humiliated. <laughs> and then finally, we made in this our life, and Betty at last got to play the bad sister, yeah. and I played the good sister, and we became great friends. Does she still scare you? Just a little. <laughs> but I love her. <laughs> This must remind you of your night on This Is Your Life in London. Well, it's 1938 now, and Miss Betty Davis wins her second Oscar for Jezebel, directed by William Wyler. But most stars would rest on their laurels, but not you, Betty Davis. You make more demands, not only on yourself, but on your studio. You fight Warner Brothers for the right to choose your own films. You lose a bitter battle, but you win the admiration of the motion picture industry. In 1939, 40, and 41, you are among the top 10 box office stars. In 1943, you do a picture called Now Voyager with Paul Henry. The scene where he lights two cigarettes, remember, at the same time, creates a fad that lasts to this day. Here he is, your co-star from that picture, Mr. Paul Henry. Henry, how was that famous scene born? Would you tell us, please? You may join her over here. Like well, uh, in the script it said that uh, um, I should uh, hand Betty Davis, uh, offer Betty Davis a cigarette. She would take a cigarette. I would then take one myself. 
I would light her cigarette, I would light my cigarette, <laughs> and then I finally would take her cigarette out of her mouth, mine out of mine, give her mine, take hers. <laughs> and be charming all the time. Yes. <laughs> so I suggested to Betty to simplify this whole thing and just have two cigarettes and light them both at the same time and offer her one. Betty adored it. Our director didn't like it, I remember. He didn't like he the didn't idea like at all. He didn't like much of anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> would, yes. would, you please, yes. would you light a cigarette uh, for Miss Davis? I'd be delighted to do it. Do you know this uh, cigarette case, Betty? Yes, I do. Betty yes. gave it to me after deception. Oh, yes. I hope I can do it still. Oh, my. Oh, I think you can. I think you can. Mom, well, let me tell you about this. <laughs> the right music too, I hope you notice. Sir. To the orchestra, the uh, right music. Uh, oh. Thank you, Paul Henry. Thank you so much. You. By 1954, two more Academy Award nominations for Miss Betty Davis, All About Eve and The Star. Soon after, you require serious surgery. After a lengthy convalescence, the unsinkable Betty Davis bounces back stronger than ever. Pictures roll in for you, and you play two unusual roles with this gentleman. I played Betty Davis's piano accompanist and sweetheart at one picture, and her father in the next. That's the voice of a very talented young performer who worked with you in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and Hush Hush, wow. Sweet Charlotte, Mr. Victor Buono. Wow. Two, two, the address is heaven above. <laughs> well, if I sit there, you might end up over here. <laughs> Victor, a sweetheart and then a father? Yes. Well, when one has the honor of working with Miss Davis, one matures quickly. <laughs> Take the two ways. <laughs> well, you and Betty were both nominated for Academy Awards for Baby Jane. Yes, it was my first nomination, and only nomination. It was Betty's tenth, and I was. And I didn't get it. Well, there's <laughs> in the next one. The next one. I was overwhelmed, and I was soon overpriced and didn't work for six months. <laughs> Victor, how did you, as a newcomer to motion pictures, react when you first met Betty Davis? I didn't know whether to bow or wave banners, which is worthy of both. Thank you, Victor Buono. Betty, as we said at the beginning of the show, you're probably the most imitated woman in show business history. My impersonation of Betty Davis has kept me working for at least 20 or uh, 15 years. <laughs> That's the voice of Barbara Heller of television and nightclub fame. I know it is. Has Betty uh, ever seen you do your act? Yes, yes indeed. It. She's a wild audience, you know. Yes, yes she, she really was is. marvelous. She's marvelous well, doing it. Well, she thank really you, is. because she's my favorite actress. Always has been. I think I, I think I do impressions, uh, sort of subconsciously. You know, I've seen so many of her pictures, and I watch them over and over. It's sort of like I'm brainwashed with it. So, uh, you well, know, she's the most brilliant. As a special I'm treat, a... would you do a little yes. of your impersonation of Betty Davis? <laughs> You thought I'd never ask. I just happened to be prepared. Oh, good. Oh, another cigarette, Paul. <laughs> Give me that cigarette. <laughs> I should like to do a scene from one of my greatest pictures, but then aren't they all? <laughs> My goodness, there are those, Betty, who say no one could ask for a better or more loyal friend. When every door in Hollywood was closed to me, Betty Davis befriended me. The voice of an actor friend of yours, Mr. J. Robinson. Oh. Jay, we know that in 1958 you were arrested on a narcotics violation. You spent 15 months in prison. 
and for many years your burden was unbearable. Uh, how did Betty try to ease that burden? Well, she never stopped encouraging me, writing me letters of encouragement, and very recently she helped me get a role in my first feature film in 13 years, a film called Bunny O'Hare. You know, Ralph, uh, many years ago I played the part of the Emperor Caligula in the movie The Robe, and I watched that motion picture on a very small television set while in prison. I understand Betty made some statements to Dwight Chapin of the Los Angeles Times, and he put them in a letter form and sent them to you. Would you mind reading some of the comments of that letter? I'd be happy to, Ralph. I first met J. Robinson in 1955, and not again until we worked on Bunny O'Hare. But whatever happened, I feel that it was his case not ours, and the drug involvement was over in 1960. He is one of our very great actors, and having been told of his problems, I have only admiration for his having overcome them. He is in a fine position to encourage others. Jay never talked about what happened to him. I know he's been through his own private hell. I think we should forget about it. I believe his life experiences have enhanced his talent, and I believe that given the opportunity, he can go on to much greater things. Betty Davis speaking for her fellow man. Thank you, Jay Robinson. Uh, we have a very fine day for you. Uh, with memories of your life depicted upon it, especially created by Marshall Jewelers of Fifth Avenue, New York City. So Betty Davis, that eternal spotlight that keeps shining on you, knows a very important truth. You supply its light. The world is your stage, and we're grateful to have that ticket of life that allows us to watch you perform. What you have given can only be returned with love. You're a legend in your own time. This is your life, Betty Davis. Thank you. Betty Davis, a remarkable woman, a brilliant, consummate actress dedicated to excellence, a star, now and always. Ralph Edwards, thank you for being with us, and we hope you join us for the next edition of This Is Your Life, The Classics. <laughs>